welcome back or just welcome if you're new here. I'm Carmen Free. I'm an employment relations practitioner and I'm also the owner and director of Free Employment Relations. I have included a list of my credentials in the description box below to give you some peace of mind around the content that I share. Today's video is about deductions from an employee's income. What is an employer allowed to deduct and what are they not allowed to deduct? This is something that employers often unknowingly do incorrectly. It poses a risk to employers in terms of non-compliance with the legislation and it poses a risk to employees to have deductions made from their income that is not permissible. In this video, I'm going to cover all of the information on how to avoid this. Before that, my disclaimer. I cover a lot of information in these videos, but I'm not able to cover every exception to the rule or every nuance. Therefore, these videos are for educational purposes only. Please contact a professional if you need further assistance. My next disclaimer and also who this video is for. In today's video, I'm going to be discussing deductions as they are detailed in the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. This video is therefore applicable to employees and employers who fall under the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. If your employment relationship is a subject to a sectoral determination or a bargaining council main or collective agreement, you can still watch this video and it's going to contain a lot of important information. However, you do need to supplement the information in this video with what is contained in your sectoral determination or in the collective agreement for the bargaining council. This is one topic where it is quite common for there to be variations from what I'm going to discuss in this video in the sectoral determination or in the collective agreement. Just as a small mention in particular, the retail sector and the hospitality sector have specific additional requirements around deductions from employees' income. If you would like me to cover those or assist with the interpretation of a specific sectoral determination, clause or a specific bargaining council collective agreement, please comment down below and I'll see if I can do that for you. Now in today's video, I'm going to unpack in detail the requirements for deductions as laid out in section 36 of the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. In the Basic Conditions of Employment Act, deductions can be found under chapter four. Chapter four is all about the particulars of employment and things related to remuneration. I'm going to cover specifically what the act says regarding deductions, but I'm also going to explain to you how we practically implement this and things that you can do as an employer to mitigate risks around non-compliance when it comes to deductions. A final thing that I would like to say before I dive into all of that information is that I provide a lot of free information in these videos in the hopes that it makes employment relations more accessible to all and thereby enriching the experience of the employment relationship for everybody who is a party to it. This does come at a cost to me and if you find value in my content, I will greatly appreciate if you support me to make more of it. Ways that you can support me is that you can invest in some of my affordable templates that are linked down below if you'd like, comment, subscribe, and share my videos, that's very helpful. And also I've recently added a new way that you can support me, and that is that you can buy me a coffee or donate to my channel. There's a link down below if you find value in the information that I share and would like to do that. And then I also just want to say a massive thank you for being here. By being here and watching my videos, that is also supportive for me. Now let's get into all of the details about deductions. To ensure that you leave this video very equipped with information about deductions, I'm going to go through section 34, starting at the top and working through every single one of the clauses. Section 34 of the basic conditions of employment is deductions and other acts concerning remuneration. The first clause of this section lays out that there are only two ways in which an employer can make a deduction from an employee's remuneration. Yes, only two. So if they do not fall under one of these two, then it is not a third deduction. So how it states this, 34.1, an employer may not make any deduction from an employee's remuneration unless. Now the first way, 34.1a, subject to subsection two, we're going to talk about subsection two in detail. The employee in writing agrees to the deduction in respect of a debt specified in the agreement. So that's a very important point. Deductions need to be in writing. When we read labor legislation, if the act says something like there needs to be an agreement, 
If it is not specified that it needs to be a written agreement, then a verbal agreement is sufficient. But specifically with this clause, it is saying there needs to be a written agreement, which means there needs to be an agreement that is on paper and signed by both parties or their representatives. There's two ways that we practically do this. The first way is in the contract of employment. In every single contract of employment that I draft, there is a specific section related to deductions. And under that section, I detail the deductions that we know are being made from the employee's remuneration, but then I also detail ones that could possibly be made from the employee's income. If you would like to use my contract clause for deductions, I have linked that down below and for a small fee, you can purchase that. You can copy paste that into your contract and remember, you want to make minor adaptations to it to ensure that you list every single deduction in your business that is being made from an employee's income or any deduction that you think may be made from their income in future. The contract is a written agreement. So it covers the requirement for the deductions being in writing. This is very useful in particular when it comes to fixed deductions, deductions that we know are being made on a monthly basis. However, the contract clause on deductions is not sufficient on its own. The reason that this is not enough to cover all of the deductions is because that first section specifically says, in respect of a debt specified in the agreement. And of course, we still need to discuss subsection two. So all of this is subject to subsection two. We're gonna get there in a moment. If this is sounding confusing, it's going to come together. For now, remember, I said one of the first ways that we practically implement this point is through a contract clause. Now for a specific debt, in addition to the contract clause, we will use a deduction agreement. So this is an agreement that the employee will sign agreeing to a specific debt that is going to be deducted from their income. Two main deductions that we typically use this agreement for is a salary advance or a loan, or if the employee broke something or in some way caused a financial loss for the business. My deduction templates are linked down below for a small fee you can purchase and use them. There's one specifically for salary advances and loans. And there's another one for deductions that are for breakages or a loss to the business. There are going to come some more requirements to making those deductions. But first, let's finish up the last part of section one. We've covered the first of two ways that deductions can be made, that the employee needs to agree in writing to the debt specified. Now this second one, 341B, the deduction is required or permitted in terms of a law, collective agreement, court order, or arbitration award. I'm gonna give you some examples of these. Examples of deductions that are permitted in terms of a law. The most common one is tax, pay as you earn. You do not need a written agreement to deduct pay as you earn from an employee's income. It is a legislative requirement for employers to do this. But even though it is not a legislative requirement for you to have a written agreement in order to deduct pay as you earn, I do still recommend that employers put that in their contract of employment. This is because I think it is good practice for employees to know upfront at the onset of their employment what is going to be deducted from their income. Many people don't understand that there is a difference between cost to company or the gross income and then what they get. It's good practice to make it clear what's going to be deducted from their salary. It's also necessary to put it on the payslip so that they can see what has been deducted from their income. Another very common example of this is UIF. This is permitted in terms of a law. It's also a requirement from employers to deduct UIF from an employee's income and pay it over to the fund. An example of deductions made in terms of a collective agreement. The most common deductions that are made are are the levies to the council. There are also specific bargaining councils that have funds, that there is an agreement that the employees will contribute to the fund and that the employers will deduct a specific amount or a percentage of their income towards this fund. In these cases, the collective agreement is completed by the employers organizations that represent the employers and the unions that represent the employees. So a specific individual employee will not necessarily sign this agreement, but it still governs their employment. An example of a deduction that is permitted or required in terms of a court order is often referred to as a garnishment or an emolument attachment order, EAOs. These are court orders that obligate an employer to make a specific deduction from an employee's income and pay it over to a specific person 
or an organization. The most common ones I've seen for this is maintenance orders for child or spousal support. Then a final one is deductions that are required or permitted in terms of an arbitration award. This is if a case went to the CCMA, went through the arbitration process, and the commissioner found that a specific deduction needs to be made. This is usually for something like repaying of things like training that the employer paid for, or some kind of loss or damage to the employer. And that is the two ways that an employer is permitted to make deductions from an employee's income. The one we just discussed is deductions that are permitted or required in terms of a law, a court order, a collective agreement, or an arbitration award. For those, you do not need a specific written agreement for them. The other one that we discussed a little bit earlier on in this video is that you have a written agreement to make the deduction. But remember, that one was subject to subsection two. So now let's look at subsection two. 34.2, a deduction in terms of subsection 1a may be made to reimburse an employer for loss or damage only if. What that is saying is if you're going to deduct money from an employee's income, so first you have it in writing to the debt specified, but then secondly, if it is for loss or damage, then you need to ensure that up and above it being in a written agreement, it's going to meet the following four conditions that are specified in subsection two. Something important to know when you are reading legislation is always look out for if there's a list of things, if there's more than one thing that they're listing, do they say or, or do they say and. The first section we discussed is there are two ways to make a deduction. So it was a written agreement of a specific debt or a deduction that is permitted or required in terms of, and then it lists them. So it's one or the other. Both those conditions do not need to be true for the deduction to be fair. Now with subsection two, there's a list of requirements that an employer needs to ensure that they comply with before they're going to make a deduction for a loss or damage that they suffered. And this list says and, not or. That means all four of these points need to be met in order for the deduction to be fair. Let's now discuss the four requirements. The first one, 34.2a. The loss or damage occurred in the course of employment and was due to the fault of the employee. What that is saying is that the loss and the damage occurred while the employee was employed with the employer. It didn't happen before they were employed and it didn't happen after their employment was terminated. It happened while they were an employee of the employer. And then also that it was the fault of the employee, essentially that the employee is responsible for this loss or this damage and that the employer can prove it. The reason I'm adding the and the employer can prove it part is because if a deduction is going to be challenged in terms of its fairness, the employer is going to have to prove that it was the fault of the employee. Here's where some deductions, sometimes unknowingly, but sometimes knowingly, become unfair. An example of one that I've seen happen quite a lot is where an employer deducts a specific amount from a group of employees. So for example, in hospitality, it is common practice for employers to deduct a specific amount for breakages. And they deduct this from all of the employees that could be involved in those breakages. But if this deduction were to be questioned, an employer is going to have to prove that a specific employee was responsible for a specific amount monetary amount in terms of that breakage, not general breakage loss and not it could have been that employee. Another example that I've seen happen in the workplace is when there are stock losses or something quite expensive goes missing and the employer holds that entire department or all of the employees who had access to that stock responsible for the loss. They might split the amount amongst the entire department. This, however, is not compliant with what we just read because what we just read said that it is the fault of the employee, which means the employer is going to need to be able to show that that specific employee who they did deducted money from their income was responsible for the loss or the damage. Not that they could have been responsible or that they were a part of the department that is responsible. So it's not just that they were possibly involved in it. The employer needs to prove they were involved in it and they did participate and they are responsible. That's the first requirement. Now, the second requirement. The employer has followed a fair procedure and has given the employee a reasonable opportunity to show why the deduction should not be made. There is a lot of legislation that employers and employees need to be aware of when it comes to the employment relationship. And I make these videos because there are a lot of specifics, 
that govern specific topics. But the one thing that I want to come in here and say is that when in doubt, if you don't know what the legislation says and you need to decide what to do, always err on the side of give an employee an opportunity to state their case before you do anything. And that's exactly what this section is saying. This section is saying, follow a fair procedure. So there are many, many things in the employment relationship that have this requirement. Follow a fair procedure. And sometimes it will detail what a fair procedure is and what the specific requirements of that is, but sometimes like this, it won't detail that. So what it means in terms of the fair procedure here, because it says follow a fair procedure and, but it's actually telling us what it requires from that fair procedure is that you give an employee an opportunity to show why this deduction should not be made from their income. How this typically plays out is that that when you're making a deduction for a loss or a damage, there's usually some kind of behavior from the employee's side where the employer is going to instigate a disciplinary process. So that is to say they're going to have a disciplinary hearing because there was some kind of behavior that led to the damage and the loss. You'll typically have charges like negligence in that you did not do this thing, which resulted in the item breaking, which was a loss to the amount of X, Y, and Z. Or it will be something like not following company policies and procedures in that you did not do this other thing, which resulted in damage to the company's asset to the amount of, and then it would be the amount. Or another example is willful damage to property or a breach of the vehicle regulations or the health and safety regulations, which resulted in something happening. And then usually we include the amount. If you need assistance with drafting charges for disciplinary hearings or with drafting the wording of offenses on sanctions, I have some useful templates on my website and I've linked those down below. So in this case where the employer has decided to have a hearing for the behavior that possibly resulted in the loss and the damage, the chairperson in that case ought to know that in addition to discussing whether the employee is guilty or not guilty of that particular offense, because it relates to a loss or damage to the business, they need to discuss an additional element and that is what is required in the basic conditions of employment around deductions. When I chair hearings and I see that there was some kind of loss to the business, I will ensure Sure that there is an additional part. Once I have found the employee guilty, if they're not guilty, then there's no point in discussing that because like we said, it has to be the fault of the employee. That was the first requirement. So if it's not their fault, there's nothing further to discuss. But if I find that they are guilty on a balance of probabilities to the charges and therefore responsible for that loss or damage, I'm going to have an additional discussion where first I'm going to ask the employer about the amount and also whether they want to hold the employee responsible for for the damage and the loss. And if they do for the total amount or a portion of the amount, then I'm going to give the employee an opportunity to explain their side and give them an opportunity to state why this deduction should not be made. If as an employer, you are using a professional and experienced chairperson to chair your hearings, they are likely to know this information, discuss this information and ensure that this fair procedure requirement is met. They're also likely to iron out all of the details that need to be in the agreement and and also provide you with an agreement that the employee can sign for this debt. However, if they don't do that or you're handling this internally, then this is my reminder to discuss that. And if you need to have a deduction agreement, you can use mine that's linked down below. I also have other videos on chairing hearings and templates related to chairing hearings and sanctions in the hopes that assist employers in an affordable way who want to handle this internally to ensure fairness, compliance, and efficiency. And on that note, I would like to dispel a very common misperception. A lot of people believe that if you issue a disciplinary sanction, so for example, a warning to an employee for loss or damage, that you are not able to recoup your loss. A lot of people incorrectly assume that this is double punishment. This is not accurate. It is not a double punishment. You are not punishing an employee by recouping the amount that the business lost as a result of their behavior. This is not considered a double punishment. You can and should issue a disciplinary sanction in a addition to that deduction. Of course, you don't have to deduct money from an employee's remuneration because they broke or lost something, and that is your choice, but just know that you can in addition to issuing a sanction. Now the third requirement, 34.2c, the total amount of the debt does not exceed the actual amount of the loss or damage. This one may seem very obvious. The amount that you're going to deduct from an employee's income should not exceed the actual amount that the business lost as a result of the loss or damage. But consider things like this. 
the item that the employee broke is pretty old, but now you need to replace it with a brand new one. The value of the new one is not necessarily equal to the value of the old one. It may also be the case that you decide now is a good time for you to upgrade and purchase a better model. And in that case also, the value of that item is not the value of the one that the employee broke or the loss that they caused to the business. As an employer, you need to figure out what is the actual loss that was caused by the employee's behavior and whatever you deduct cannot exceed that. Another one that I saw happen once was an employee broke an item that was insured. The employer wanted to hold the employer responsible for the price tag of that item. However, this would not be considered fair because the employer did not lose that amount of money. What they lost in that case was the excess that they needed to pay to their insurance. So the employee cannot be held responsible for the total price tag of that item, but rather they can only be held responsible for the amount that the business lost. So nothing exceeding that insurance excess that the employer needed to pay. There are also times where employers want to make deductions where it is incredibly difficult to quantify the loss or damage to the business. The most common example, and I've covered this in another video, is when employers want to deduct notice from an employee who did not give sufficient notice of termination, as in they did not resign with sufficient notice as stated in their contract of employment. Now, even if a contract of employment states that you are going to deduct that amount from their remuneration, remember that is a subject to subsection two, which is what we're discussing right now. And subsection two says the amount that you deduct cannot exceed the loss and damage to the business. So my question is then, is the loss to your business exactly equivalent to the notice the employee was supposed to give? And to answer my own question, it's probably not. And it's very difficult for employers to quantify what the actual loss or damage is to their business from an employee not giving sufficient notice of termination. So those are just some examples to make my point that it is not always clear cut what the amount of loss or damage is and ensuring that you stay equal or below that in order for the deduction to be fair. Now the final one, 342D. The total deductions from an employee's remuneration in terms of this subsection do not exceed one quarter of the employee's remuneration in money. Now there are some things to discuss here because there is how this is practically implemented by most people in the employment relationship and how it's recommended to be implemented by most professionals giving advice in terms of the employment relationship and then I also have some concerns about that if we read this section. So how this section is commonly interpreted is that people commonly interpret it to say deductions from an employee's remuneration should not exceed 25%. That means that when you want to deduct something, you need to count up all of the deductions that are being made from the employee's remuneration and ensure that they do not go above 25%. And usually this is done on a, let's say the employee's paid on a monthly basis, on a monthly basis. So if the employer wanted to hold an employee responsible for something that is quite expensive, how this is typically implemented is the employee will pay off the amount over several months to ensure that the amount that is deducted does not exceed 25% of the total deductions. Now, this is such a common occurrence that if you look up what is the basic conditions, section 34 to D say, most blogs, most websites from reputable sources is going to say some version of the deductions from an employee's remuneration do not exceed one quarter of the employee's remuneration in money. So that being said, I've now explained how that is typically implemented in the workplace by most people. And also I've actually seen this go to the CCMA many times and there were no red flags raised about it. It's been commonly accepted in several cases that I've done. I'm not saying that means that all employers can do this and it's okay and it's not going to be question. I'm simply saying how much of a common practice this is. And because of that, my template that is linked down below for deductions and losses does include a section that covers what amount of money will be deducted every single month and for how many months is going to be made. But now let's discuss my concern. My concern with the way that this is currently being implemented in practice is that the act does not say that 
the amount of deductions should not exceed 25% per month. But somehow it's kind of generalized to say that. Let's look at what it actually says one more time. The total deductions from an employee's remuneration in terms of this subsection do not exceed one quarter of the employee's remuneration in money. The part that's often left out by other professionals when we discuss this is the part that says in terms of this subsection. Now, often people interpret this part to be the section, like section 34, but it's not saying this section. It's saying this subsection, which means it's only referring to subsection 2 of section 34. And subsection 2 only refers to deductions in terms of a loss and damage. People often group the deductions for UIF and pay as you earn and make sure that all of those deductions in total do not exceed 25%. But those deductions do not relate to subsection 2. Those deductions relate to subsection 1b. And the other part that is raising my concern with this is do not exceed one quarter of the employee's remuneration in money. So my question is, can we interpret this section to mean that you can deduct the large amount of money in smaller portions on a monthly basis? Because the act doesn't refer to that it should not exceed the monthly amount. It should not exceed the payment made for that period. It's saying the employee's remuneration in money. And it's also saying that the deduction for this section should not exceed 25%. What I'm thinking is in a way to interpret that to say that the loss that the employee is held responsible for cannot exceed 25% of their remuneration in money. That's where there might be differences in terms of interpretation. Anyway, I think that is some food for thought and some food for discussion. I'm eager to hear if if you've got any insights that you want to add to that or any experience that you would like to add to it, because like I said, all of my experience I've ever had with deductions is that it was accepted that the large amount was divided into smaller amounts that do not exceed 25% of that payment period, and it was deducted over a period of time. But reading the act, I do have my doubts as to whether that's actually an appropriate way to do it. And that concludes subsection two. Let's move on to subsection three. The rest of the deductions part that I'm going to discuss now is just some additional information or some variations when it comes to a specific type of deduction. But we've covered the main points where it comes to if you're going to deduct anything from an employee's income, you got to make sure it falls into one of the two categories. So the written agreement to a debt specified which is subject to subsection two, which we just discussed has its own four requirements that you need to meet all four or it is one that is required or permissible in terms of a law, court order, collective agreement, or arbitration award. Now, section 34.3. A deduction in terms of subsection 1a. 1a was the one that refers to the written agreement for a debt specified. In respect of any goods purchased by the employee, must specify the nature and quantity of goods. This is commonly seen in wholesale and retail. When employees are allowed to purchase things from the business and it is deducted from their income. The requirement here is if an employee is purchasing some kind of goods either from the employer or the employer is doing it on their behalf is that there needs to be documentation that specifically shows the nature. So that's to say what that item was and the quantity, how many of them. My recommendation is either include that on the payslip or if your payment systems don't allow for that, have a additional document. And this is what a lot of businesses do. They have an additional printout that is stapled to the back or attached to their payslip that shows the number of items that an employee purchased that is being deducted from them as well as what those items were. So this is just a reminder to everybody is you cannot simply say goods purchased. That's not enough. You have to specify what those goods are and how many of them. 34.4. An employer who deducts an amount from an employee's remuneration in terms of subsection 1 for payment to another person must pay the amount to the person in accordance with the time period and other requirements specified in the agreement, law, court order, or arbitration award. That's simply saying if an employer is going to deduct the amount of money from an employee to pay it over to another person 
or to an organization like we discussed all of those examples they must do it in accordance with that award that order or that agreement which usually specifies by when this needs to be done and how the payment needs to be done then number five, which is the final section of section 34. An employer may not require or permit an employee to A, repay any remuneration except for overpayments previously made by the employer resulting from an error in calculating the employee's remuneration or B, acknowledge receipt of an amount greater than the remuneration actually received. This part is simply saying that if you are going to deduct some income that was granted to the employee, you can cannot deduct that unless it is as a result of overpayment and you cannot as an employer make an employee acknowledge that they receive a larger amount than they actually receive. This section is simply allowing employees to rectify a mistake that they made in terms of income but not arbitrarily deducting income from an employee. So if an employer is going to deduct an amount from an employee that's related to work that they did so it's not related to a court order or any of those others and it's not related to loss or damage then the employer needs to show that it's as a result of an overpayment and an error made on their side that they paid the employee too much and that brings us to the end of section 34 which discusses deductions from an employee's income in my opinion and in my experience, deductions is a part of the legislation that is quite difficult to do what the act expected of employers or what the purpose was when that legislation was written. I think there are parts of it that could definitely do with some clarification in terms of what the act says versus what is practically being done. I have found in my experience that many practitioners spend time discussing deductions being made and whether they are fair and the practicalities around that and there isn't always a clear cut yes do this no don't do that what can you do in this scenario there's a lot that isn't very easily to implement fairly with that all being said I do hope that this information in this video is helpful for you to be able to understand deductions to be able to implement deductions if you are an employer or a manager or a leader and then just my final thing is just remember when in doubt always give an employee a opportunity to state their case but then also when in doubt out with deductions get it in a written agreement and you can use my template that is down below and that concludes today's video thank you so much for being with me today and just a reminder that if you find value in my content I would appreciate additional support from you to assist me to make more of this content so you can subscribe like comment please let me know in particular what videos you would like to see what questions you would like me to cover and what other information around the employment relationship is valuable to you also share any of my content or any of my documents with people that you think will find value in them. Purchase my templates if you think that they're going to be useful for you and if there's a template that you need that's not on my website you can pop me an email and I can see if I have it and I just haven't uploaded it yet. And then finally you can buy me a coffee or make a donation to my channel and that's linked down below. Thank you so much for watching today's video.